Thank you, Sophie. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Tale. I'm a zoology student and I'm really, really interested in entomology, so the study of insects and in particular beetles, which I'm going to be talking to you about today and how important they are in your garden and how to encourage them into your gardens and what kind of things we might find. So, yeah. So some facts about beetles and insects. So 80% of the world's flora and fauna are insects, of which Coleoptera, which are the beetles, is the most abundant order. So that in the world, there are over 400,000 described species, and there are still thousands more to still be discovered and described. And in the UK alone, there are 4,000 different species. Um, and if you were to line up a single, a single species of every known living organism, including plants, one in five of these would be a beetle. So that just shows there is so, it's such a diverse order. So you can see in the little pie chart that I've got here, um, Coleoptera is the yellow part, so that's the beetles. And you've got Lepidoptera, which are the butterflies and the moths. And then the Hemiptera, which are the true bugs. Hymenoptera, which are bees, wasps, and ants, and Orthoptera, which are the grasshoppers and the crickets, and then the other orders of insects. So you can see just how abundant and how diverse the Coleoptera are. So just some general anatomy of beetles. So Coleoptera means sheathed wing, and that refers to the hard exoskeleton. All insects have a hard exoskeleton. Um, and they have three body regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. And crucially in beetles, they have elytra, which are the hardened wing cases. So beetles have two pairs of wings. They have the flight wings, which are delicate and they fold them underneath the um, elytra, which are these hardened wing cases. And then you have the elytra on the top that you can see. And crucially in beetles, they will meet in a T shape. So at the base of the thorax, um, you have the horizontal line, and then that goes all the way down to the base of the abdomen from the scutellum. And also with beetles, a lot of them are predatory. So they have these mandibles, which are chewing mouth parts. And um, I'll show you why that's important in a minute because that's different from um, true bugs. So the life cycle of a beetle. So beetles undergo complete metamorphosis, which means that they, similarly to um, butterflies and moths, they'll go from an egg and then the eggs will hatch out into larvae and the larvae undergo several instars, which are different molts. So they shed their skin multiple times, so they grow. And then they'll um, turn into a pupa, so they pupate, and then they will hatch out as an adult beetle. And these beetles are fully grown. They don't grow anymore then. Um, so yeah, that's fully sized beetle. And um, in ladybirds, um, the larvae are really strange looking. So I thought I'd include them because some people were like, what's that? And it is a ladybird larvae. And um, when ladybirds emerge, their um, spots and colors don't, um, don't form just yet. So it takes some time for the color pigmentation to come through. So if you find like a yellow ladybird, it means it's probably just emerged. Um, and the stag beetle life cycle is also really interesting as the larvae spend up to seven years in dead wood. So this is why this is such an important habitat that you might want to include in your garden if you can. And I'll talk more about habitats and things later. So what's not a beetle? So these are the hemiptera, which are the true bugs. And there are over 1,700 UK species of these. And these mean, it means half winged. So this refers to the wing cases and where in beetles, they meet in a T shape. In um, Hemiptera, they will either meet in an X shape as in the shield bug or in a Y shape as, um, as shown in the frog hopper. And people may know of frog hoppers in their garden and the um, nymphs of this species will produce cuckoo spit, which is like lots of little bubbles. You see them on plant stems sometimes and they're like protective casing against predators. And these have sucking mouth parts as opposed to mandibles like a beetle have. So yeah. So beetles are really, really, really important in our gardens. So, and generally they, they perform really good ecosystem services. So they're really, really important pollinators. 
Um, e in evolutionary terms, beetles are one of the old first pollinators. So um, yeah, they're really, really important. Um, they also are um, involved in decomposition. So they can de help decompose carrion, wood and dung. And they're also really important as biological controls. So um, as you may know, ladybirds will feed on aphids and other, they will also feed on other pests such as slugs and snails. So they're really, really great to have in your garden. So now I'm going to go through um, a few of the main families that you might find in your garden. Um, and just generally, um, these are really distinctive families in the beetles. So the first ones are the carabids. These are the ground beetles and they range from two to 30 millimeters. So they can get quite large and they they have these protruding head and mouth parts because many are predatory. So they tend to have very large mandibles and they will feed on um, slugs and snails. So these are great to have in your gardens um, to um, help control them. And many are actually unable to fly as they have um, fused wing cases. So they do tend to just dwell on the ground, but some of them can fly. So um, yeah, and the top, um, photo is of Nebria, Nebria bevericolis. So this is quite a common one that you tend to find under rocks and in leaf litter and things. And then the one underneath is the violet ground beetle, Carabus violaceus, which is really, really beautiful. They've got this kind of um, distinctive purple outline, which is really iridescent. And yeah, these are quite large. So if you find them, they're really quite impressive. So then we have the Staphylinids. These are the rove beetles and they can be really, really tiny. Um, and these are really distinctive as they have this short elytra, which means the really short wing cases. So it means at least three segments of the abdomen are exposed and the wings fold right under the wing cases. And um, so sometimes they, I think they kind of look like um, little millipedes or something, but they are beetles. So um, most, most of these are predatory, so great for pests. And they also can feed on fungi, um, algae, decaying plant matter, and some are even parasitic. And the pictures that I've got here of Occupus olens, this is the largest species in the UK. And you quite often see them on like paths and things. And um, they'll perform this defense display if they feel threatened, where they lift up their abdomen and they like open their mandibles. They're really quite impressive. It's the devil's coach horse beetle. So these are really cool. And then we have the chrysomelids. So these are the leaf beetles and they do, they are found on vegetation, they feed on leaves. And I just wanted to highlight, I put in three pictures, but there are so many different variations in this um, family. So um, they can be brightly colored or metallic and can even show very color variation within um, a, spe a specific species. So um, you have to check the identification. Um, and the first one, so Liliocris lilii, um, as a gardener, many people know about these as they are considered pests, they're the lily beetle. Um, however, they are actually um, um, parasitized by several species of parasitic wasps. So again, even the pests, beetles feed into the food chain and are really beneficial for other animals, which are great to have in your garden. So yeah, still important. So if you can manage with a few holes in the leaves and things like that, and there's only a few, then they should be absolutely fine. And the next one is the um, Chrysalina americana. So this is the rosemary beetle. And um, these are um, really beautiful metallic stripy beetles. And again, they, um, in small quantities, they're fine. They will feed on the rosemary, but um, yeah, they can be um, slightly problematic if you have lots of them, but they should be fine in small quantities. And then um, we've got the Cassidine beetles. So this is Cassida viridis in the corner. And um, this is the tortoise um, beetle. And these are really cool. They have a kind of, they're able to flatten themselves against the leaf 
if they're feeling threatened. And um, so the birds can't lift them off the leaf basically. And they, you can find them on plant stems and the larvae are really cool. They're really weird looking. They actually cover themselves in their own feces. So um, to deter predation which is strange, but interesting. <laughs> um, yeah. So then we have the coccinella day. These are the ladybirds. Many people don't realize that ladybirds are actually beetles. Um, and these are really distinctive. You can identify them by the number of spots. Many people know there's the seven spot ladybird. So um, coccinella septum punctata, they're normally the Latin names actually tell you how many number of spots they have. And um, we also have the harlequin ladybird in the UK. So this is um, Harmonia raxoridis. It's actually not a native species and is causing problems for our local seven spot ladybirds and two spot ladybirds. However, they do still control pests. So they do still feed on aphids. So in that respect, they are beneficial to a gardener. Um, and these tend to be a lot larger than our native species. Um, they also have thousands and thousands of different variations of spots. So if you if it's not a distinctive seven spot or two spot ladybird, um, it's probably a hormone, the Asian ladybird. So um, there is actually a really good fold out FSC chart for ladybirds. So that's really good for a visual identification guide, which I use all the time. And um, so yeah, they're great for pest control. The larvae and the adults will feed on aphids. And then I also included the orange ladybird and um, as this feeds on mildew fungus. So again, really important for gardeners. So now we have the weevils. Um, so we have two main families of weevils, the apionids. These have straight antennae, as in the top photo, and curculionidae, which are the true weevils. And these have antennae, which are in a right angled shape. You also get short nose and long nose weevils. So in the top, it's um, the green nettle weevil. These are really beautiful. They um, are very metallic blue, but um, be weevils crucially are made, their wing cases and bodies are actually made up of scales. So the coloration is made up of scales. And um, sometimes if you find an older individual that's gone through more wear and tear, it might be slightly duller as they, the scales will rub off over time. And then the bottom picture is of Coculio glandium, and this is um, the acorn weevil. So you'll find these on oak. Um, so these are the cerambicids, which are the long horn beetles. I think these are amazing. They're really, really distinctive, quite large. And um, they have all have these really, really long antennae. Um, and many of these species live in wood as larvae. So again, dead wood is really, really important habitat for these guys. And some are sacroxylic, which means that they'll spend their whole life cycle in wood. So they're always associated with dead wood. And others will feed on flowers, such as the picture here, which is Rapella maculata. And um, yeah, you can see it's, I think it's an oxide daisy. So yeah, these are really lovely to see in the summer. Um, so then we have the Cantharidae. These are the soldier beetles. So unlike other beetles, which have quite a hard exoskeleton, these are quite soft. Um, so the cuticle is quite soft. And these are really, really common in the summer on flowers, in wildflower meadows and grasslands. You can see these everywhere. Um, they're, many of them are predatory, so they'll feed on pests and things and but they also feed on pollen so yes and the one on the left is Raganita fulva this is really really common so you'll see these everywhere so then we've got the scarabs these are um really distinctive so you've got the chafers and the dung beetles in this family and the chafers um here all feed on leaves they're attracted to light so that's why you tend to get things like may bugs and in the top picture, um, you know, kind of bumping into your windows and things. If you have an outside light on, they're quite bumbly flyers. So you can, you can tell when they're coming, they're very loud as well. 
and um, they all have these white C-shaped grubs. I think they look a bit like king prawns. And, um, and they, so the ones we get in here, we've got um, Melanoth melanothus, so that's the May bug, the cockchafer. Um, and then we also get the green rose chafer, which is this really beautiful, bright metallic green, very distinctive beetle. And then we also get Phyllopertha horticola. So these all have very, very similar looking larvae, but Phyllopertha horticola are actually, their larvae can um, be a pest in lawns. So they'll chew like the roots of grass. Um, but again, it's actually really difficult to tell these apart as larvae. So you know, removing them, you'd have to check the identification first. Um, but yeah, again, in small quantities, they're not a problem. So, yes. And then we have the dung beetles. So you might not find these in your garden. They will come to light. So, and they're really, really good flyers, a lot of them. So you may get them in your garden, you might not, but um, they are associated with dung. So they're, they um, provide an invaluable ecosystem service of dung removal. And it actually in the UK it saves the cattle industry 367 million pounds per year. So they're just really, really important. Um, and in the UK, we get dwellers and these live in the dung. So they spend the whole life cycle within the dung. And then we also get tunnelers, which will live in the soil beneath the dung. So they tunnel through the dung and will drag the dung into chambers in the soil and um, live their life cycle out there. And in the UK, we actually don't have any of the rollers, which are the ones that roll the dung um, stereotypically. Um, but they're really great. They help to control fly numbers. So they eat the fly eggs and the larvae in the dung. And they'll also um, help to control um, pests for, um, that will infect the cattle. So really, really important for farmers as well. So um, in the top picture, it's the minotaur beetles. So these have really cool horns and, um, and they're tunnelers. And we've also got a Fodius rufipase. So this is the middle photo and um, they are dwellers. So they'll live in the dung, very stereotypical um, species. And then we also get geotrupes and this one is geotrupes stercorarius. And in the bottom corner, and these, you quite often see these actually on footpaths in woodland. Um, so just watch where you're, where you're stepping because they kind of just bumble along and um, they're also tunnelers. So, yeah. And then we have the Lucanidae. These are the stag beetles. So uh, this is the largest species of beetle in the UK, Lucanus curvus. They have these extended mandibles in the males, which they use to fight rival males and to like chuck them out the tree basically, which is really cool. And um, the females have reduced mandibles. Um, they're also quite big. And um, we also have the lesser stag beetle in the UK. So Dorcas parallelipipedus, I think it's got a really cool Latin name. Um, these are much smaller. Um, and the male and female both have these reduced mandibles. And this is the bottom photo. And they tend to be a lot more black in color as opposed to um, Lucanus curvus, which is quite a bit more brown. So I actually have um, some specimens that I found dead. So you wouldn't be able to kill these ones. And so just to show the difference, so this is the, can you, can anybody see that? This is the male. Um, so you can see the huge mandibles and it's, it's quite sizable. Um, and then we have the female. So this is the female. I don't know if you can see very well, but it, it's more brown. Um, it might be better to see from the pictures in the, in the uh, slide. And then this is Dorcas parallelipipedus, the lesser stag beetle. So you can see it's a lot, lot smaller and it's a lot more black in color. So yeah.
So those are the stag beetles. I actually have seen a male and a female recently um, in my local woods. So that was lovely because they are in decline in the UK because of the lack of deadwood habitat, which they really, really need to survive. So yes, great to encourage these into our gardens. Next, you've got the um, Elaterids. These are the click beetles. And um, these are more like a woodland species, but you can find them in your garden. Um, they perform this really cool click defense mechanism. So they have this prosternal spine, which they flick against their abdomen and it kind of just inverts them and it basically propels them out of the, into the air. So um, away from predators and they've got this quite distinct shape. Um, yes. And then sylphidae, these are the carrion beetles. So again, these are very distinctive. They're quite large beetles and they are associated with carrion. Um, so the males will actually bring the females gifts of carrion. Um, so the females will lay their eggs in it. They actually one of the few beetles to exhibit parental care. And if the, la so they'll feed the larvae and if the larvae beg too much for food, um, the adult will eat them, which I think is quite funny. Um, um, and so, yeah, this is the species in the top picture. So in, they can be called sexton beetles as well. And, and this is Necrophorus vespaloides and they can be attracted to light. So you may find them in your garden. Um, yeah, quite large species. And we also have um, Silphora trata, and this is actually this called the snail hunter. So it has this elongated um, head and neck, which it kind of in, inserts into um, a snail shell and will basically eat the snail from the inside. Um, so these are great to have in your garden. Um, so to predate on snails. So then we also have the water beetles. So if you have a wildlife pond in your garden, it's crucially a wildlife pond, I mean, without fish because the fish will eat anything that they can fit in their mouths basically. And it means you just won't get beetles in the same way. Um, so they're really quick to colonize new ponds and many are predatory. So they'll feed on mosquito and fly larvae. And the, um, the larvae of the beetles are also predatory. So you can see the picture here is actually feeding on a tadpole. So um, they, they ca they're quite ferocious. <laughs> um, and so we get um, some distinctive families within this. So you've got the ditiscids. So these are the diving beetles. So in the top picture is the great diving beetle. This is the biggest species that we have. Um, and yeah, they're really quite large. So you'll know if you find them when you're pond dipping. Um, then we have the hydrophilids. These are similar to the diving beetles, very common. And we also have the gyrinidae, which are the whirligig beetles. So these are the ones that you find swimming on the surface, going round and round and round. And they're quite silvery. So that's the middle photo. And then you get the helophoridae, which are the scavenger beetles. So these won't swim. These kind of crawl through vegetation and feed on algae and decaying plant matter. So it all helps to keep the ecosystem running smoothly. <laughs> So now I'm going to talk a bit about habitats that you might want to include in your gardens that are really, really great for helping to encourage beetles, as well as many, many other insects. So a log pile. Um, these are really, really important deadwood habitats for beetles. Um, maybe finding an undisturbed area in the garden, maybe like at the back of the garden, if you have a kind of wild area. And it's really important to bury, partially bury the logs at the base, as this creates the rotting wood environment, which is really, really important for things like stag beetles and many other larvae of beetles that will only occur in um, decaying wood. And then you fill the any large gaps with dry leaves and they create um, habitat for even small mammals. And you'll often see um, the beetle boreholes are really distinctive because they'll be really round. So you can see in the logs when a beetle's been in there, it'll be quite a round hole. Um, so yeah. Um, another um, way to arrange your logs is in stumpery. So this is basically just 
tip them, put them vertically in the ground. And um, so digging a pit about half a meter deep, again, to encourage the rotting wood habitat um, in the ground and then placing a log, basically the longest one in the center and then kind of stacking them out from there and then compacting the soil around the logs so that it's just really stable. And yeah, it's just great for stag beetles. This is one in my local woods. So obviously it's working. So just as I was walking to take the photo, there was a female stag beetle there. So yeah, really, really important habitat. And then leaf piles, this is, seems really simple, but beetles um, love a leaf pile. Um, decaying leaf litter and things like that are really great for um, ground beetles. And if you kind of can leave them, maybe um, around plants and things, you'll get the snails hiding in there too, and then the um, beetles will have a source of food. So um, that, that's um, really good for, yeah, that. Um, and then we've got stones or a rockery. So this is quite a large rockery. Um, you don't need it to be this big, just a few rocks and stones piled on top of each other. Um, and this, again, like if you had maybe like a border of plants and you could kind of arrange the rocks around it um, would encourage the beetles to hide near where the food sources are, like the slugs and the snails and the wood lice. So um, you'd kind of get that intermediate boundary between the plants and where the beetles are. So yeah, these are really great. Compost heaps. So this is actually the compost heap that I have in my garden. Um, it's um, really important. Many beetles will lay their eggs in compost and the larvae will exist in compost. And they also help to keep fly numbers down. So they'll feed on the larvae of the flies and things like that. And, um, but really crucially with a compost is to have, um, if, if you have a compost um, container to not have a plastic bin because plastic, it's obviously not breathable. There's no slats in it. The insects can't get in and out. So it's really important to have either a wood one or just an open one. Um, some people don't like to have it open. So something like this is ideal with the slats in the wood so the insects can get in and out. So yeah. And then this is a beetle bank. So a beetle bank is basically just like a mound of soil about 45 centimeters high. It can either be like a round mound or like elongated into a kind of bank shape. Um, and basically just planted with tall native grasses or wild flowers. So you can see this one um, um, is has just been obviously planted with lots of wild flowers and it was just teeming with life. There's um, bees love it and you'll get beetles hiding in the grass and beetles really like the raised soil. So they like to bury in the, in the soil. Um, so yeah, and then if you need to cut it back, cut it back right at the end of the season. And then if you can leave the cuttings because this creates another habitat for beetles to hide in and overwinter in as well as many other insects too. So yeah, this is really useful. And then plants. So I'm not a gardener myself, but I do really like gardening. I've gotten into it a lot this summer um, and just trying to encourage insects into your garden as much as possible. So native plants are great, but actually a mix of flowering plants from different countries has actually been found to be the best um, for insects. And for beetles, open flowers are really, really important because they're quite large, they're quite heavy and um, because of their exoskeleton. And um, so they need something large to land on that's gonna be stable. So open flowers such as like buttercups or oxide daisies or hogweed and cow parsley, they're really great for things like, for things like beetles. And then simple flowers. So what I mean by simple flowers is, um, so you can get, um, gardeners quite often will um, really enjoy quite ornamental plants. So something like a geranium, you can get either the simple flower with five petals, or you can get the really, really ornamental ones with loads of petals and it looks really fancy. Same with roses. So, um, and actually 
for insects, it's much better to have the simple flowers as um, the plant takes up a lot of energy to make extra petals. Um, so, so this energy is actually used up making extra petals when it could be put into making nectar for the insects. So simple flowers are much better as they investing more energy into making nectar, which is much better for the insects. Um, and then um, leaving dead heading for as long as possible. So um, again, an overwintering habitat for the insects, it's great. And no mows. So if you can, and you have a lawn, um, leave it um, because it will, it's really, really good habitat for insects. You'll get lots of wildflowers emerging over time the longer you leave it. And um, yeah, it's a really, really great habitat. And just some general um, plants that are really good for insects, um, specifically beetles, things such as dog roses. Thistles are great. Um, lots of it, beetles like to um, live on thistle stems. Um, hawthorn is really, really important for things like longhorn beetles and nettles as well and brambles. If you can leave a, leaving a wild corner at the back of your garden to let these things just grow is really, really great for beetles. Something like the nettle weevil will only occur on nettles. And quite often with beetles, they have a host plant. So if you want to encourage a specific beetle, look up their host plant and plant some of that and you'll probably get them there because they're quite specific. So yeah. Um, and so this is just some extra information that I wanted to include. So um, if you wanted ex more information on how to identify things and some guides, the FSC fold out guides, they do a really, really good one for many, many different um, you know, birds, butterflies, um, trees, different things like that. But the beetle ones, there is a ladybird one and a longhorn beetle one. And they're really, really good visual quick guides. If you find something in your garden, you quickly want to look it up. I use them all the time and they're really, really helpful. Um, recording schemes. So for things like um, ladybirds and well, anything, basically, if you find it in your garden, it's really, really great to record it. The scientists really want to know um, from citizen science projects where things are so they can monitor changes over time. Um, so there are specific ones for longhorn beetles, for ladybirds. There's also one for carrion beetles. Um, so yeah, if or even just I record is a great general one. It can also help with identification too. Um, and then um, I'm, I'm not a gardener, but um, so if you want more specific gardening tips for insects and um, beetles, there's specific pages on the RHS website, which are really, really helpful. Um, and they, yeah, they provide tips and information and what to plant and things like that, which is really good. And then, Wild About Gardens. So this is a website and they actually just brought out a publication called Bring Back Our Beetles, which is kind of like, kind of, it was a little bit of a summary of what I've been saying today um, in a little fold out, um, in a little booklet even. And that's um, really useful for just a quick summary um, on what beetles we have in our gardens and what's really good and how to encourage them. So yeah, I think that's, everything. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be really happy to answer them. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tally. That's absolutely fascinating. And I did tell my daughter the other day about the carrion beetle um, um, in relation to her asking for more food. Um, so um, it hasn't worked, but <laughs> I thought, um, <laughs> might as well try. It was fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> um right so if anyone has um any questions tally if you would like to um stop sharing your screen and then yeah. i will switch to um gallery view please feel free to turn your videos on um or uh, use the chat facility um so if you would like to ask a question um you can wave your hand ferociously at the screen um or use the chat function We're all quiet today. We're suffering from information overload. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
Okay, well, I will start us off then, because I, um, and we sort of spoke about this briefly the other day, um, we inherited some um, sort of green, uh, horrible plastic compost bins. Um, so uh, hearing what you were saying about um, leaving it open, I can, every time I open it up, tons of stuff comes out. Um, yeah. But is there anything more I can do to the sort of compost to encourage beetles spe specifically? So, yeah, um, things will, um, if there is a lid, things will find their way in, such as slugs and snails and, and fly larvae and stuff. They can crawl through small gaps. Um, but w if it does have a lid, just even just leaving the lid off will encourage bigger things like beetles um, in. And yeah, um, yeah, I guess just leaving the lid off, if it is just a bucket, they will still be able to get in if it's just open um but yeah brilliant brilliant thank you so much that's really useful i'll definitely do that um uh right we have a question from uh rebecca would you like to ask the question in person rebecca yeah i will uh, just to let you know sophie i know you want always want feedback i came in through eventbrite and um at the bottom it doesn't have the when you come in through eventbrite i've lost my re reaction thing so i couldn't raise my hand Oh, why that happens through them, right? It's a much simplified toolbar. I don't know why that's the case, but oh, they're always updating things. Weird. Anyway, and um, uh, not working. <laughs> <laughs> Tally, thank yeah. you so much. Learned so much, and I'm kind of a bit, you know, I see because and I think they're amazing, but I've got nothing about them. So thank you for that. <laughs> no so worries. Do something and see if you can help me. I picked up this piece of wood. Um, yeah. It was in Bushy Park um, okay. and scattered on the ground. It's, um, I don't know if you can see, can you see there's these yeah. kind of like greens? It, so it's, it, that's the outside of the tree. Uh huh. And this is the just underneath the bark. But yeah. Are they stag beetle? Um, I've done that. Was it like a standing up tree? I don't know. I just found this bit of wood oh, on the ground. It was on the floor. Okay, because yeah, normally with stag beetles, dead log. Yeah, there's loads of dead logs in there. So yeah, so normally with stag beetles, they'll tend to lay their eggs on things that are on the floor. So yeah. it will be more like standing, rotting logs, um, more likely. But um, something like that from like a tree or from bark like that probably is more likely to be like a longhorn beetle. So they'll they'll lay their eggs in wood, and um, so yeah, that's probably likely to be a. Um, also, with um, I didn't actually mention this, but um, beetle larvae are actually tend to be double the size of the beetle because it takes so much energy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they tend. So if you get the adult beetle, the larvae are. It's kind of a rule that they'll be double the size. So. Yeah, and when you find holes that big, it's, yeah, the larvae can get quite big. Um, if you've seen a stag beetle larvae, they they can get really, really chunky. And um, um, yeah, because they it takes a lot of energy for them to pupate successfully. So they have to gain loads and loads of fat reserves um, first. So yeah, so that's probably um, a, a longhorn beetle. Larvae. Yeah, and at the end of each, at the end of each of these capsules here, yeah, it's got like, a, like chewed up where obviously where it's uh, it's presumably is it's poo. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, it's got like a chewed up bit, you know, it's kind of oh, like, okay. like it might even be like a pupation chamber, like it um, may well be. Yeah. What a marvelous yeah, so find. What I know I came across it. I'm going, oh, my goodness. Um, and I'm thinking then that's why the woodpeckers go up go, yes. into these trees. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly that what may have even doing. actually pulled this off, might it? Because they might have drilled yeah. so much that there's, yeah, that's there's a true. hole at the top here. Look. Oh yeah, yeah, quite possibly. Anyway, that's really cool. I've been waiting <laughs> to show somebody this, and then today happened, so I thought I would. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's a fantastic find. Brilliant. I have I know, that on a display I table, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, right, we have a couple of comments coming in. Um, uh, Anne says, thank you for a really great talk. Fascinating and great to be able to put some names to some creatures in the garden. Absolutely agree with you, Anne. 
Um, uh, and just to echo that as well, um, Tanya has said, uh, what a fantastic presentation, no questions, but only because uh, the talk was so clear and comprehensive. I've always been a bit nervous of Beatles, but I'm now really fascinating, fascinated. You and me both, Tanya. Um, <laughs> I've been spending ages looking at my pond um, in the garden, the, the newly created thing, and now I'm just out looking for beetles. Um, I don't know what this two months has done for me. It's changed my class. <laughs> Brilliant. Would anyone like last... to... Sorry, am I allowed to ask another one? Go for it, Rebecca, absolutely. So what eat the beetles? What is... Do would spiders eat beetles? So, I mean, if they... Yes, smaller beetles probably if they get caught in the webs, they will, yeah, spiders will eat them. Um, but so I mean, lots of things get prim, predated on by birds. Um, mm -hmm. small mammals will eat, um, things like, like ground beetles. Um, yeah. you'll actually when you, um, pellets, so owl pellets and things like that is really cool because beetle. The exoskeletons of beetles, specifically the elytra, the wing cases, are so hard yeah. that they'll you can often identify the beetle that they've eaten um, from what's in the pellet. Um, so that's quite cool. Um, but yeah, small rodents will eat them. Um, yeah, <laughs> they're they're a good they're a good food source. Um, yeah, for bigger things too. Thank Brilliant. you. Um, I actually have a, a question about recording. Um, so what's the best way to go about recording these things because um i know in many of our cof coffee mornings we've discussed um sort of use of wildlife identify identif identification apps um yeah. but actually properly feeding into um citizen science what's the sort of best way to do that I mean obviously we've got the Surrey Biodiversity and Information Centre yeah but if someone was looking to focus on beetles um what yeah. would you recommend what's your advice so um I mean yeah so there are specific recording schemes so if you know because longhorns are so distinctive that's why they created one for that because they're it's quite easy to know that you found a longhorn and then record it as one. Um, and they'll help, all of these things will help with um, identification as well. Um, the ladybird as well, again, because it's so distinctive and the um, sylphid, the carrion beetle recording scheme. Um, so they're, they're the kind of, I think there are more for beetles, but they're the kind of main ones I can think of. Um, and yeah, generally, like I record is good. Um, I mean, there are always like pages online that will help with identification if you have specific questions or need to send them in. Um, and yeah, just, um, yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's what I can think of um, for now. But generally, I record is always good because any records on there will be fed into the respective um recording schemes anyway i think that's how it works so brilliant oh that's good to know because um i know i use um uh, seek and i'm oh, okay i don't know if that gets fed in anywhere yeah, at see, all. i don't know how they share the data i'm not mm. quite sure but um yeah i think there are always going to be experts on these that know yeah that can help so brilliant yeah. brilliant um, so does anyone else have any questions? This is the, I can't believe it's the last um, coffee morning themed around um, wildlife gardening. It's been a busy old two months. <laughs> and I hope everyone is engaged with at least a little bit of wildlife gardening, um, even if it's no mo may or um, putting in ponds or planting for pollinators it's been um an incredible two months with um lots of amazing speakers um and we've had the wonderful tally to um close our season um okay i don't see any more questions so i'm going to um draw this um coffee morning to a close and say thank you so much for attending everyone. Uh, all your support and interest in our subjects and coffee mornings and evening talks. 
um, and to Tale, um, formidable knowledge, uh, just incredible. Um, I, I googled Tale um, to find out a bit more about her because she's had a long sort of working history with our um, education team and uh, th this long sort of biog of talks from the age of how old 11 12 yeah. um, <laughs> like <that. Yeah. laughs> on Beatles and stuff like that just so inspiring to see the younger generation and I hope that doesn't sound patronizing <laughs> but keep going it's absolutely brilliant um, and uh, I look forward to having you back um, hopefully next year at one of our events you'll be doing a sort of talk on the stage for us that would be amazing that would be really cool thank you so much for having me it's been great <laughs> Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you for uh, coming along. Uh, Bill says, Abs another fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, please check out our website for um, up and coming talks. We've got um, a talk on uh, the Sand Martin project, which is absolutely amazing. Um, we basically built a, I think it was 20 foot sand castle for San Martins, that was the press release. Um, and uh, uh, you'll find out sort of how that's uh, gone as a project. Um, and we also have a, a talk on night jars as well, um, because obviously it's night jar season. Um, so if you're out and about um, at Chobham Common or Ockham, um, listen for that really amazing, distinct churring noise. It's unmistakable. Um, and um, if you want to sort of sign up to the talk, um, you'll find out lots of amazing information from James Hurd, our Director of Conservation. Um, and next on the agenda is Rivers Week, uh, which is September. And we will be doing um, a host of talks on beavers, um, the history of rivers, ponds and invertebrates, um, and celebrating all things to do with rivers. Um, so please keep an eye out. Um, I've got a busy week ahead. Um, putting all these events online so um, sign up and I look forward to seeing you all soon thank you so much thank you Tale thank you so much thank you <laughs>